Hey everyone, we will get started in just a few minutes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed the eerie music to kick us off. Uh, welcome to Heat Pump Hell. I'm Shelby, one of the co-founders at Conduit Tech, and I'm thrilled to be your MC for this morning. I know many of you are ne neck deep in the complexities and challenges that come with the rising prominence of heat pump installations and the wave of electrification. We all know that there can be many benefits to heat pump installations, whether it be improved comfort, efficiency, and even health advantages. But with great power, literally and figuratively, comes great responsibility. And preparing for a mass scale transition to heat pump systems requires time, effort, and hard work. So over the course of this webinar series, we're gonna to touch on important pieces of heat pumps, high efficiency installs, and electrification more broadly. Today, we'll start with a 30,000 foot view, navigating the challenges of mass market implementation. The following four weeks, we'll review design and sizing, my personal favorite, installation, commissioning, and standards, and wrapping it all up with a focus on the IRA and rebates. So today, we are joined by some of the leading voices in the industry. These experts are not just experienced, but will speak to where our industry is ahead of this heat pump revolution and what we can do to prevent it from becoming heat pump hell. Um, we'll understand the challenges, the pitfalls, and most importantly, where we must all adapt. We're joined today by Jim Bergman, founder and president of MeasureQuick, Dominic Guarino, CEO of National Comfort Institute, and Jeremy Begley, founder of HVAC Design Partners. So with, with all that said, thank you so much for joining us and let us start the journey for, uh, away from heat pump hell to a world where heat pump technology truly benefits us all. And with that, I wanna introduce our first speaker, Jim Bergman, who is the founder and president at MeasureQuick. He has been a technician, an instructor, a company owner, a salesperson, a technical writer, uh, and a design engineer. I know many of us today have been fortunate to benefit from his incredible wisdom and his incredible companies, and we're eager to dive in a bit more today. So with that, Jim, we know this has been something on your mind. Back in February, you wrote an open letter on electrification. Can you share with us over the, the course of the next few minutes what that letter was about and why it was on your mind? Yeah, so it's um, last year, it actually a uh, Brian Orr's event. Uh, he does an HVAC symposium every year. And uh, we had sat down with a uh, with just a group of people to sort of have this high level discussion on stage about uh, electrification and heat pumps. And I was just completely taken aback at, 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 at what a, how, how excited everybody is without really this um, understanding the reality of, of what we, we have in front of us. And, you know, it's all started with really um, Bill Spone and, and Nate Adams. They're both uh, real good friends of mine, and, and they both uh, are very staunch champions of electrification, and, and they both put in... Um, in heat pump systems and they both had problems on the first cold snap of the year and you know to both the, both these guys were like super transparent about what was uh what was happening uh to them and both of them got the problems resolved really quickly but i, I got to thinking about you know bill and, and nate probably have more resources at their disposal than 99.99 percent of the industry and yet they faced some challenges with electrification. 
And that's going to be a huge problem when we try and, and do this at scale when we have people that have just a fraction of that uh, industry knowledge and um, skill in front of them. And it, it really just comes down to some some uh, some very substantial problems. Um, and it, it starts out with um, with the skilled labor gap right now. We have a we have a, uh, a huge number of technicians in the field that just simply are not prepared to install heat pumps. Um, there was just a study that would, I was reading on impact installation faults. And, um, and it, uh, I'll sort of quote it here uh, um, on a, as close as I can, but um, that indoor airflow and refrigerant charge levels were going to create a huge energy increase uh, for air source heat pumps. And like they only had 14% of the homes were air source air source heat pump that they were responsible for 39% of the total energy increase. The small amount of heat pumps is going to create a huge amount of problems on our grid because they're not going to have correct charge in airflow. And we're looking at even like uh, uh, Building America just released a study maybe two weeks ago. I want to say like 24% of systems are charged properly. Those are air conditioning systems. Heat pump systems are far more um, complex when it comes to charge. They, they really they have to have the correct amount of refrigerant in them to not only get the correct heat output, but to have good longevity and not have problems with, like tripping on a limit. And um, and then even a capstone this week was a call from a manufacturer that is part of an upcoming DOE study that wanted to know if, you know, I'd be, would possibly participate in installing a, a heat pump in my house. And it had very certain cri interesting criteria, like it had to have a, a very small heat load, like 55,000, 60,000 BTUs. But then on top of that, um, you know, it, it, uh, it had to go all, uh, all electric. And they wanted to show, you know, in, in our climate, because I'm in a northern climate, you know, how, uh, how this could work. Well, the, the problem is, is we have duct systems that were designed to deliver a quantity of air at let's say a hundred degree temperature rise and now we're putting heat pumps which may have a 30 degree temperature rise going from systems that you know the airflow was required at let's say 1200 cfm or or less to now a system that requires 2000 cfm airflow and so they were literally looking at the equipment without considering the duct system and this is going to be a huge problem when we look at uh, existing home stock. So it's it's this reality that um, as an industry we've been like stuck in a in a rut of our of our thinking when it comes to technicians and and contractors. I mean it's uh, uh, we're doing things like uh, we we accepted a lot of industry norms like callbacks and equipment failing prematurely. Uh, contractors are still primarily selling entry level equipment. Um, they're not properly maintaining systems. You know, that's a, a very common problem. And then, you know, we got a, this whole um, disconnect between uh, uh, homeowners and contractors when it comes to the Internet today. Uh, a lot of homeowners are really um, better educated about heat pumps than, than contractors are in some cases. Because contractors aren't preparing for this. And the homeowners are hearing about it on you know, they're getting inundated with things on television and inundated on uh, with media, but they aren't, um, and, and they're interested in electrification, but their contractor, when they call, they aren't getting that same uh, type of advice or same types of, um, you know, cautionary tales. Just, they're, they're not, they're not helping them to make a good decision on whether they can do this electrification. And so, you know, it's, for, for me, it's been, um, what we've been doing with Measure Quick for the last, you know, seven years is is trying to um, stay ahead of this and try and help people to actually get these types of systems commissioned properly. But we we can't we can't do it alone. And, and this is where you know this, this whole group of us I think is really is key. Is there's so many elements of this when it comes to uh, equipment equipment sizing, the duct sizing, the commissioning of the equipment, the selection of the equipment. There's so many elements that we we have to take into account, and we're we've we've been very blessed in this country. Energy's been so cheap, and so we've applied cheap solutions to the cheap energy. And all of a sudden, this is going to change, and energy is going to become 
very uh, a very precious commodity because we're going to put a lot of load on our grid with poorly operating systems, and I, I really think we're going to see some some uh, some huge problems if we don't if we don't keep ahead of this right now. And so that's that's really where 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 we've been working, um, and I think you know it, it's it's going to come down to uh, realistically is you know, proper sizing, proper equipment selection. Um, addressing the the duct work uh, and especially duct leakage if we're outside of the envelope, um, proper commissioning, which means a, a proper evacuation uh, with a very good decay test. This is another issue we are we're we're not paying close attention to. Is you know, air conditioners they operate with coils above 45 degrees. It's not been a problem for years, but now we're we're going to be running these things in the winter and the outdoor coils far below freezing and any moisture in that system is going to cause problems with freezing up in the metering device or freezing up electronic expansion valves. And again, these, these systems, there's no way to thaw that out without applying an external heat source, which is not an easy thing to do when you have a heat pump sitting in the middle of the winter. And then you got to remove the moisture on top of it, which is also not easy to do. And if these aren't installed correctly, now our backup heat is probably electric heat. And we've just taken our, our you know, highly efficient heating source and turned it into the least least efficient heating source you could have. I mean, we look at it, theoretically it's 100% efficient, but it's extremely expensive because a heat pump can get three to six times the amount of energy uh, out of the air that, that a uh, that a straight electric can. So you know, these are these are all challenges that we're 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 up again uh, up against, and um, we've done a great job identifying, but we haven't done a real good job fixing them. And I think that's where our big mistake is. And so um, we're in desperate need of, of education. And we're really today at MeasureQuick trying to solve this problem with uh, technology and software that's going to really take uh, several years of, um, of our experience and put it in a technician's back pocket. Um, and it's, I think, you know, we're, we're all working along that same line. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim, for, for that powerful message. I, I could not agree more. There is so, so many pieces uh, to this puzzle. So thank you. And on that note, if anyone has questions, please do share them. Uh, we will be taking them for the last 15 minutes of this conversation and, and we'll address those questions then. Um, so with that, um, this is a great opportunity to introduce our wonderful second speaker, Dominic Guarino, who is the CEO and chairman of National Comfort Institute. Dominic co-founded NCI in 1994 with Rob Falk and has since grown it into the HVAC industry's largest independent training and certification organization. Dominic joins us today to share his thoughts on the state of the industry and how the HVACR industry can successfully drive the energy efficiency movement. Dominic, you gave a talk at, um, at the AHR show back in January about the state of the industry, and we'd love to get your thoughts and share some of the themes that you identified uh, with the group today. We know it will benefit quite a bit. Thanks, Shelby. Uh, great to be here this morning. Um, honored to be um, asked to be in this um, podcast. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll jump right in and I premise by saying that uh, contrary to some popular belief, there's nothing wrong with heat pumps. I mean, themselves, they're great products. They've improved significantly. The manufacturers, I think, have done a really, really good job in uh, making them more efficient, uh, working better, and so forth. But, but I also have to add that heat pumps are not the panacea that many electrification programs uh, would like you to believe. Um, they're not the solution to everything. Um, and also, as Jim mentioned, uh, we have a long way to go as far as our industry getting trained up to actually install them correctly. Um, there's My hope is that uh, over the next few years that uh, electrification programs begin to recognize that dual fuel is a great option uh, where you can use the heat pump down to a certain temperature. And of course, there's a outdoor a sensor that would tell you, okay, it's time to switch over to gas or oil or whatever the other fossil fuel source might be uh, so that you can get the best of both worlds and as efficiently as possible. And in some cases, heat pumps don't make sense at all. Um, 
uh, where especially ultra cold climates, uh, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense uh, to use a heat pump. Um, the the one thing is that struck me about this big movement is w one of the biggest problems with heat pumps and actually split you know um, DX systems in general is the today's products heat pumps AC uh, units and so forth um, are a lot more sensitive to the external conditions uh, that it's facing. And by that, I mean external to the equipment being primarily the duct system. And um, I've, I've shared this before in other venues that if you look at performance and you look at the ability to deliver capacity uh, and go back 25, 30 years or more, there was a bell curve that looked something like this, so a nice rounded bell curve. And then as long as you stayed within that top of that bell curve, you got pretty good delivery. Uh, of course, there were always problems with duct work and so forth that needed to be solved. But by staying within the bell curve, you got your efficiency, you got your actual delivered performance within, within reason. Today, um, well, I would say over the past several de decades, that bell curve went from being curved like this to getting smaller and smaller and smaller and now it almost looks like this it almost looks like an arrowhead and uh if you don't hit that peak performance right in that tiny little zone at the top of that arrowhead um it's kind of like falls off a cliff uh, especially the comfort side which is you know delivering that those btus into the space or removing the btus uh, as it were so it's really important and, and as Jim said uh, very um, effectively, that uh, they know uh, the technicians that are working on these products, installers that are installing them, know how to properly test both the refrigerant side of the system and the air side of the system. Because uh, if you don't test, we have a saying, if you don't measure, you're just guessing. They're just guessing at it, and it's very likely that they will not hit that um, performance curve, if you will, at the top of that curve. Um, so we have to make sure the entire system is able to deliver um, the capacity of the equipment. Um, number one reason that they uh, it won't uh, is typically that um, poorly designed, poorly installed ductwork um, just won't allow the, the, the fan to properly move the BTUs, if you will, uh, and uh, it can be a major challenge. So it's important that we know how to test, and there's some great instruments out there, including and, and products like software like MeasureQuick that really make a difference in uh, being able to do that testing. But we have to get out there and use uh, in mass, if you will, within our industry. And we're a long way from that. We've been at this over 30 years and probably still less than 10% of the industry actually measures or tests anything. And I'm, I might be being generous uh, saying 10%. So uh, again, matching systems, making sure they're matched properly and impor more importantly, matching the system to the ductwork. Can the ductwork actually handle the airflow that's needed to get the comfort to the right places. Um, other issues is if you're if you're dealing with high static pressures because of mismatching your ductwork to your system, uh, you have other problems, including possibly some health issues due to mold and so forth growing in the system. If your pressures are very high, you can actually cause blow off on the coils so that moisture blows into the ductwork and it could just sit there and start to grow stuff. So we have to be very cognizant of that, that we're not over, uh, you know, put it, pushing too much velocity through those coils. Um, a few other things, uh, as Jim mentioned, proper charging. Now, those of you who know how to properly charge a system know that unless you know what your actual airflow is, not just some number that's pulled off a chart, but the actual airflow moving through that system, it's nearly impossible to charge it properly. So we have a lot of work to do. We have to train, educate close to 400,000 technicians 
uh, that are in the field today, technicians and installers. And, uh, you know, trade schools do a great job for what their, their role is, but they spend very little time on educating about these things um, because they have so much to cover uh, that a technician needs to learn. So we can't rely on the trade schools alone to educate. Um, it's really up to us. It's up to our industry. It's up to our manufacturers, the distributors, training organizations like NCI and others to bring that level of education up and get more people involved. Um, the good news is we have better training than ever. We have better tools than ever, and of course, software as well, so that they can properly install and service uh, these uh, new heat pump systems. I have hope that, that we can rise to the challenge as an industry and, and, um, and begin to truly educate our people on, on how to do things right. And uh, looking forward to listening in on the rest of this uh, webinar, as well as the, the following ones in the series. Well, thank you so much, Dominic. I could not agree more. Uh, NCI is one of the incredible organizations delivering a lot of that training, um, and there's a lot of incredible technology out there to support uh, support the technicians in the field. And there's a lot. There's a lot to learn, and it's a tough job, so it makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Well, with that, thank you so much for joining us, and I am thrilled to introduce Jeremy Begley, who is going to share a little bit more on this very uh, special topic. So he is a seasoned expert in high-performance HVAC design, particularly for single-family and multifamily buildings. Jeremy began his career at Cincinnati Energy Solutions, where he introduced innovative models for home performance contracting. Since then, Jeremy founded HVAC2 Home Performance, a consultancy focused on residential and light commercial testing and balancing, um, including HERS ratings, BPI energy audits, and lead home ratings. He is the founder of HVAC Design Partners, a venture focused on high performance HVAC design, testing, and commissioning for single family residences and commercial multifamily buildings. Jeremy, I'm eager to turn it over to you uh, to both touch on crit the criticality of HVAC design and to ground the overviews Jim and Dominic provided into some real world examples. So over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Shelby. Um, today, uh, we're gonna get into a, to talk a little bit about uh, a broad overview of where we are in the heat pump in installation industry and some of the challenges that face us and it's uh, going to be setting us up for the next few webinars that we'll be doing uh, that will dive deeper into some of the concepts we touch on today. Uh, if you can see my screen there, I think it's important to always remember that there's nothing new under the sun and even though everybody may not realize it, we've actually been here before. Uh, as you can see, carriers add there. Um, when heat pumps were first introduced back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and they were going to be the solution then too. Um, just some succulent little points out of the ad uh, that that sound eerily familiar if you think about it. Um, it talks about uh, the fact that it could replace a furnace if we needed to. Um, you could supplement it with gas or oil if you wanted to for less expensive heat. All things are still true. Uh, heat pumps were going to be a solution that were going to lead the market. It's no longer enough to fiddle with the thermostat or pull down the shades. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, you, yes. We can't see your screen. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So let's see. It's important here. Huh. It's not letting me share, Ben. Hang on. Let's see. Because it says I'm in the presentation. Someone is currently sharing. Alrighty then. Um, I don't know if I can solve that right now. It looks like there's a technical glitch. So we might have to do this without the slides. Uh, you'll kind of maybe add some color and then we will record this session and upload a uh, kind of an augmented version that has the additional slides added on. Do you think that um, the slide you have up are you sharing that by any chance the one that says thank you for attending because that's it's, what i see on my screen right now it's a technical glitch that i can't take down right now okay no problem we'll just go i'm used to it okay so i have an old let me paint the picture for you i have an old ad up on the screen that is uh, from the 1975 kickoff of carriers technology it reads 
Carrier technology confronts the cost of energy. With fuel and energy costs on the rise, the problem today is keeping your home livable without draining the family budget. It's no longer enough to fiddle with thermostats, pull down shades, and put up storm windows. You have to get back to the basics in choosing which air conditioning to add, what heating system could be the best supplement, or replace your present furnace. This is where Carrier is uniquely qualified to help. We're the specialist in home comfort, summer and winter. We give you impartial advice on your high efficiency alternatives. We make them all. We're deep into year round systems, for instance. Heat pump air conditioning is one for sure. The beauty of the heat pump system is that it works two ways. In the summer, it extracts heat from the inside the house. In the winter, it reverses itself back. It reverses itself and puts heat back in. Certain of our models, certain of our models lead the field in operating all oh, certain of our models lead the field in operating economy all models are among the best they are also provide the most economical way to yet heat a home in more and more areas ask your dealer for estimated annual operating costs savings based on local electric gas or oil rates soon heat pump air conditioning will be for everybody my goodness how familiar does that sound? It sounds like the same message that's being put out there right now. And anybody that has been around long enough to have went through this the first time understands what happened. There wasn't uh, enough training. There wasn't enough people that understood uh, what heat pumps actually were and what they could and couldn't do. And they got shoved into homes that they shouldn't have got shoved into. And they got a super bad name to the point where fast forward 30 years later, when I got into this industry, people that um, were of a few generations before myself hated heat pumps. They wouldn't hear of you putting one in. Um, back in, in, in the first Obama era when we were working with the Aura funds, we tried to do a lot of dual fuel and balance point systems and things like that uh, to try to uh, be m more efficient with the way we were heating and cooling homes. And there was tons of resistance from the general public because they just didn't understand what they were getting. Let me turn my slides for myself here since you guys can't see them. I still need them as a guide. So I have a slide up now that uh, reads known challenges to successful mass market heat pump adoption. So I'm going to go over three things that I think pretty much everybody agrees on um, that are challenges that we're facing right now. And then my next slide, I'm going to dive into uh, some some of the quote unquote hidden challenges of mass market heat pump adoption. So the three things that I three tenants uh, that we can all agree on, I think, number one, contractor education. We heard Jim and uh, Dom talk about it uh, quite a bit, like these contractors that are out here, they've been trained on gas furnaces, especially in it's interesting, especially in um, heating dominated climates. My brother uh, it lives and works in Melbourne, Florida. He works for one of the biggest carrier dealers down there. And I was talking to him about this this morning and he goes. I don't really see what the big deal is. We don't have problems installing heat pumps. Like we know the ductwork's an issue. We know a few things. He's like, but I just don't really understand why why there's all this hoopla about heat pumps being so hard to install. Well, when you're in a cooling dominated climate, you don't have that many choices to make. And it's easy to put a heat pump in and have it work exactly like it's supposed to, as long as you have the air conditioning side of it correct. And um, this is not that. So we need our contractors to get educated and to understand how all heat pumps work, but especially the inverter heat pumps that are being manufactured to service the cold climates and the nuances that go along with them. And this is something that we're definitely going to dive into a, 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 in the next uh, session. Myself and Alex Meany uh, will be having a very interactive conversation, uh, interactive meaning we're going to allow the audience to participate on the proper way to uh, design a heat pump and a lot of the crucial elements that you should be looking at. Uh, and then my next uh bullet point there is homeowner education and i just talked about that a little bit and it's still a real thing like homeowners need to understand how heat pumps can fit into their life and when uh they're good and when they're not and to a point that um jim alluded to is now they have the internet back when i was doing this the internet back when we first talk, started talking about heat pumps in 2009 there wasn't as much information as widely available on the internet as it was 
as it is right now. And back in 1975, you know, they didn't even have the internet. So now homeowners are educated to what I would call dangerously educated because they go out there and they make their own uh, assumptions about what's right and what's wrong. And it's hard to talk them out of that sometimes. So the contractor education um, needs to happen so that they can participate in educating the homeowners when they get in front of them and, and, and setting realistic expectations for how the heat pump will work, how it should be used in the home, when it's the right time to install one and when it's not. And uh, then the third thing is contractor uptake. So we have a lot of contractors out there right now uh, who just flat out to refuse to sell or install heat pumps. And I just read a big post on the uh on linkedin this morning before i came here about how people in one person's market are getting told that heat pumps won't work for their home no matter what if you're in a cold climate it's not going to work and we all know that that stuff is misinformation so we need our contractors to be educated to the point where they feel great about installing heat pumps in the right situation and understanding what the right situation is so that that that's our known challenges let's get into the ones that maybe not everybody are aware of. So my first bullet point here is um, this slide is entitled Hidden Challenges to Successful Mass Market Heat, Pop, Heat Pump Ad Adoption. So my first bullet point is one that both Jim and Dom touched on, and it's the single most important uh, challenge to overcome in this whole entire thing, and that's proper equipment design and specification. We need our contractors, distributors, third-party designers, including engineers. I'm gonna say especially engineers. I'm gonna talk about that here a little bit more, but like the engineering world has to catch up with what's going on residentially if they're gonna play in that world. Um, must understand the importance of detailed load calculations and equipment selection and all the necessary variables that you have to take into consideration and add as Dom and both Jim pointed out, this includes the distribution system and the airflow of the system, the airflow of the system and the distribution system, meaning the ductwork that these things are getting put on. I know a lot of people, uh, when they think about inverter heat pumps, uh, they're thinking ductless, but there are ducted variations of that uh, that just can't be slapped, and they're going to be more popular in, the, in a lot of places, especially in existing homes, than the ductless are. The ductless are finding their place, and they're finally getting legs under them, and especially in the really warm climates, they're being adopted more and more. I see them a lot more down south than I do up north, uh, but people are starting to accept them, but it's still going to be a long time before everybody's just saying, hey, you know what, let's Let's get rid of this really inefficient distribution system and just go ductless like hardly anybody's uh still it, from a homeowner perspective in in america is, is saying those words there's some people that are but not a lot so we need to understand what how these things fit onto existing duct systems and how to evaluate the duct system uh to know if it's the right fit or not and what modifications need to be done to that duct system to make that 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 heat pump work the way that it should and a little bit of this is afraid of losing the cell people want to be able to uh people when i say people in this instance i mean contractors want to be able to take advantage of some of these incentives that are out there and so you know some of them are wanting to push heat pumps and they may know in the back of their mind that that duct system isn't the right thing, but to get them to say something about it and add a duct renovation into the work scope and stand on that firmly and say, listen, this is not going to be the right thing for your house unless we do A, B, C, D, F, G. That is a big lift, and that is something that's not getting talked about at all or enough in any of the education uh, classes that I've participated in, whether it's with the distributors, the dealers, uh, or other contracting organizations like it's just not being talked about. The one place that it is being talked about, or I should say the two places that it is being talked about is Measure Quick and NCI. There's no better place to learn about airflow and, uh, and duct systems and duct renovations and things like that than from those two organizations. Uh, they've been talking about, about that stuff since they've been around. And um, NCI is where I learned everything um that i know besides trial by fire doing test and balance when it comes to airflow and things like that and duct systems like they're they're second to none in that world so i highly suggest that as a raider or a contractor you get involved with with those organizations and that's not a commercial for nci that's just my personal feelings that i'm giving you there so um my next bullet point is ensuring proper dehumidification this 
is more we're talking about uh cold weather inverter heat pumps they naturally sacrifice water removal for the sake of efficiency during the cooling cycle so they don't remove as much water so they can be more efficient and operate down at lower capacities uh you combine that with the fact that they do operate at a part load capacity and we don't really know what the humidity re removal is at those part loads i'm sure that there's a lot of math that we could do and we could get there on on this system or that system but as a whole that data is not published and it is something that you really need to try to understand uh when you're installing these heat pumps because you're going to run into problems and i'm going to show you here in just a bit the type of problems that you could run into and then we have low load homes where these things aren't running as much as they would anyway. So then there's whole periods where the sensible temperature, what the thermostat reads, is not high enough or uh, yeah, high enough for the air conditioning to kick on. But the relative humidity just is creeping up and up and up and it's getting uncomfortable in there. And people do uh, something that they've been, I'd say, trained or conditioned to do and they associate comfort uh, in the heating or in the cooling seasons with uh hot or cold and that's not always the case sometimes it's that icky sticky feeling that they can't put their finger on and they can't get rid of that's causing them to be uncomfortable and it has nothing to do with the sensible temperature it's <coughs> excuse me it's because their system isn't removing water the way that it's supposed to and then we have capacity differences depending on configuration what i mean by that is if you have a one-to-one -one inverter heat pump it may have a minimum capacity of x if you have a one to many cold weather heat pump, it has a minimum cooling capacity of something much greater than X from the one to one. So um, a, a, to put that into context, say you have a 6,000 BTU system, uh, or let's not say six, because I'm not sure that they have one to one for that, but let's say 9,000 BTU system, where you have a 9,000 BTU outside and a 9,000 BTU inside. Uh, that 9,000 BTUs by itself is probably going to turn down to somewhere around 2,500, 3,000 uh, BTUs. So you could service a pretty wide load in there. You know for sure at the turn down, uh, you're still servicing the part load conditions for that space as long as it's properly designed uh, with that 9,000 BTU. You take that same 9,000 BTU indoor piece of equipment, you hook it up to a multi-head system where you got 9,000 BTUs in one zone, 12,000 BTUs in another zone, 6,000 in another, and all hooked up to one outside condenser, which is has been up until a certain point. Now people are starting to shy away from it, and rightfully so. One of the selling points of these inverter of these uh, inverter heat pumps, and all of a sudden you're at the mercy of whatever the turndown of the outside equipment is. So let's say you need 36,000 BTUs outside to service everything in the house. In the house. Well, that 36,000 outside is only ever turning down to 13,000 BTUs or something like that. I'm I'm not saying exact numbers, but I'm just giving an example. So. What happens when to that 9,000 BTU piece of equipment most of the time, especially if those other zones aren't calling for heating and cooling, which can happen because you can control the set point of each zone. So maybe they haven't turned down because nobody's in there. All of a sudden, that 9,000 BTU piece of equipment is no longer variable. It's spitting out 9,000 BTUs every single time and you have a short cycling situation just like if you installed a single stage piece of equipment where it's just going to kick on kick off to satisfy the, the thermostat it's not exactly what it's going to do because it does modulate instead of turning on and off but you're going to get the same effect if you have that that particular situation so there's a lot that goes into ensuring proper dehumidification including but not limited to making sure that in low load situations you are specifying external whole home dehumidification to handle a relative humidity set point for times when that system is not going to run at all uh, because it's already satisfied the sensible temperature but it's 70 degrees and rainy outside or something like that so that that's a big problem now my next bullet point is going to sting a little bit, especially for uh, uh, people uh, that I, I I directly interact with and the way I came up through the industry. But it's something that has to be said. And one of the biggest challenges to mass market heat pump adoption right now at this very time, I'm not saying this will always be the case, but right now, green building programs are one of the worst things for heat pumps that exist on the face of this earth. Um, purveyors of green building programs everywhere jumped on the electrification and heat pump bandwagon very early on. Most have a pathway in place that uh, will re reward the installation of more efficient and advanced equipment, but none 
And I just want to preface this. I want to stop for a minute and say I am speaking from personal experience. I am not reflecting the views of the people that are sponsoring this uh, webinar. I'm not reflecting the views of even my own company. This is me, Jeremy Begley, who came up through the green building program world. I've done more designs from that are the result of green building uh, programs than any other design that I've done. I've done more inspections, more everything inside green building programs. And I can say that I've either directly or indirectly directly worked as a verifier in every green building program out there. And I've done design either directly or indirectly in every green building program out there. So these comments and feelings are my own, but they are uh, shared by many in this industry and it is something that needs to be addressed. So back to what I was saying, more have a pathway in place that reward the, most have a pathway in place that will reward Make sure you hear what I'm saying here. Reward, not require, the installation of more advanced and efficient equipment. But none have prescriptive minimums in place that go beyond local or, fe local or federal code guidelines, if you really get down to it. None require a knowledge base for the raters that would ensure proper heat pump installation and commissioning. None have raters uh, that are in training that are trained above and beyond what the contractors that they're telling what to do uh, know what's going on and able to do it. Now, I will say that there are organizations that uh, do green building programs that have really picked this up and started doing design uh, in-house and started trying to understand this and making sure that what they're doing uh, is the right thing for the homes and policing it. But by and large, that is not the case. Uh, we have many, many, many programs out there that lean on um, things like uh, Energy Star, which in itself seems like the right thing to lean on until you get down to the fact that they still allow uh, massive oversizing. They never even review uh, in their in in the uh, elements that are required to be reviewed by the raters. Required to be reviewed by the raters. They the five elements up until. 310 was released, ResNet 310, uh, which is a commissioning standard that we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, they didn't even require you to look at the insulation levels in the home and match those up with the load calculation, one of the biggest swingers of the load uh, that, that, that there even is. And even though um, 310 does now, the way that the 310 review is written, it does ask you to look at that, people don't have to a buy if they're getting an energy star certified house they can get an hquito certified contractor they don't have to abide by that review process they can go back to the basic review process that doesn't even look at that at all and um i can tell you right now that 90 percent of the um raiders and um qad's and other leaders of these green building programs are rubber stamping these because they don't understand them and it's not coming from a bad place they're not trying to pass this off and um say you know do something nefar nefarious to get the project certified they just don't have the knowledge base to understand what they're looking at and really hold people's feet to the fire and there's a lot of resistance in that world too well especially in the multifamily world when it comes to the engineering side of things uh the the way this so let me paint this picture for you um a little bit. So what ends up happening here is you have a green building program. I'm not going to use names because there's already been people that have got upset when I've called out programs by names, but there are programs. Uh, most programs have somebody that is a QAD or somebody in charge of doing the ultimate review of the project. Then you have the raters that go out and do the verification and verify the items that work under those people. And then you have the contractors and you have the builders and you have the other people that are actually building the house. And so in that world, when you get to do a multifamily project, the person designing the project are engineers. So engineers are known to be the authority on everything uh, that they are designing. Nobody will challenge the engineering world. Nobody wants to. Their stamp is God. Uh, they, uh, the builders and uh, the people that hire them believe in what they're saying above all else. And so, and that includes the people that are running the green building programs. They mostly will bow down to what the engineers say. So then you get engineers, and this is typical practice, and I'll stand on this because I've went to bat with many, 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 many engineers in these programs, and I've seen, you're going to see a very bad result of this here in a minute when I show a case study, but the engineers are using programs like Carrier HAP and uh, Train Trace, which are heat load programs designed for the commercial world, 
if used correctly, can be used to come up with a um, can be used to come up with a heat load calculation and equipment specification for uh, a residential application, but they don't change the commercial defaults. And so then they wind up with something like this. In a multifamily building where you have a 500 square foot one bedroom apartment, that's one ton. You have a 700 square foot two bedroom apartment, that's two tons. You have a three bedroom uh 900 to a thousand square foot maybe 1200 at the most square foot apartment that's three tons okay these loads and you're you're, you're going to see this these in a minute here these loads do not grow like that based on the amount of bedrooms in a little small apartment that barely is growing in square footage at all that has the same amount of thermal exposures which is almost none unless it's on the top or bottom of the building or on the side then you got maybe three thermal exposures at the most and these pro these programs are not actually uh, unless they went in and changed every single default in that program to something that is conducive to the house they are modeling, they come up with something that's wildly inaccurate and doesn't represent the home or the apartment or the building that's being modeled at all. And then they turn that in to the green building program uh, personnel, whether it's the Raider or the QAD or whoever's collecting the paperwork, and then those guys look at it and they say, well, they did a load calculation. It matches this size. This must be the right thing. Here's your stamp. Go ahead and install it, Mr. Engineer. We know you know what you're doing. And then you get a situation like I'm going to show you in a minute that is not even uh, an exception. It's more of the rule. I see it over and over and over again. So sizing, equipment selection, understanding all that in the engineering world, understanding it in the green building world so that it can be called out at the correct time and the right equipment gets installed for these buildings and applications is a very, very, very imperative thing. And the reason I'm keying in on this is because the green building programs have set themselves up as the leaders of this whole movement. They are the ones that are shouting it from the rooftops that we need to be installing heat pumps and we need to be taking furnaces out and they're not providing an opportunity to take into account any of the things that should be taken into account when installing and specifying this equipment and this stuff i almost said shit but it is shit this shit is going to be an unmitigated disaster like i can't even um go to sleep and have a dream about five years from now because it literally is going to be a heat pump hell if we don't change the way things are being done um, so that's that. And then my last bullet point that I have up here is another thing that people are not willing to talk about. And um, even inside the, some of the green building programs and these guys who are my, my constituents and professionals, uh, the building envelope matters. It really does matter when we're putting heat pumps in. Like we have to make sure that we're sealing things up and um, that we are getting the proper levels of insulation. And because I can tell you right now, like even though like some of the newer heat pumps are putting out 90 degree heat uh, versus 120, 130, 140, what the gas furnaces were doing, or I'm sorry, 120 degree heat versus 130 or 40, like unlike the old heat pumps that put out 90 degree heat, even at 120 degrees, that is a much different temperature difference when we're dealing with the extremes from the outside exerting force on that house and trying to heat it with a heat pump. Like, it is going to make a difference on how quickly that house heats up. And at the end of the day, people are not going to be happy in extreme temperatures when they have these heat pumps put in. And, and I will stand on that. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. If you're putting – and I hear, you know, I hear guy people – challenge this argument by saying well it would be the same you know you still have a leaky bad house if you put a furnace on it yeah but that furnace is a band-aid for a lot of things uh when it comes to comfort because of the type of heat that it, that it puts out so um that's that now let's get into my my uh case study here um this is going to be a little harder without the slides but i will try to talk you guys through it and then you'll get to see the slides at at a later time here so um um i have a really cool picture of matthew mcconaughey and true detective looking at a bunch of papers and it says let's look at a case study so that was my one little cool slide for you guys Next, I have some graphics that are from uh, just temp random temp temperature measurements that uh, using not using uh, testo probes when I went and did inspections on on these buildings. So let me just tell you what this is going to be. So two summers ago, I literally spent my whole entire summer 
on an airplane uh going to all these different a couple developers hired us to go out to all these different brand new green building program multifamily. um most of them if not all of them were affordable housing multifamily programs and they had varying levels of moisture problems in them that they could not get with some of them had people moved out some of them had people living in the corner of the apartment where i went into the apartment and they had all their furniture pushed back against the wall and they had little pans set up under the registers because the water was dripping down from the registers uh one place was so bad that when i went into it uh, i was with the, the building manager and he goes i think this tenant spilled pop on the floor it's not pop, it's water. That's how much water was in that place. The water was literally, and these are non-slick floors, and the water was so, there was so much water in there that you could slide your feet across a non-slick floor. Like, that's how much of humidity was not getting removed uh, from these places. So I have various screenshots up. I'll just read you some of this stuff, and you guys can start forming your own your own uh, picture in your head before I get into the description, which was the kind of the point of the slide. So, uh Indoor air temperature, 72 degrees. Relative humidity, 68%. Dew point, 61.1 Fahrenheit. Wet bulb temperature, 64.8. Uh, air temperature, and these are all different units. I went all, did sampling throughout the house. I picked out four of them to show you guys. I have literally hundreds of them that we could look at. Uh, air temperature, 65.9 degrees. Relative humidity, 72.5%. Dew point, 56.8. Wet bulb temperature, 60.2 Fahrenheit. And these are all in Fahrenheit, by the way, if anybody's out there thinking in Celsius. Uh, air temperature, 68.4 degrees. Relative humidity, 77%. Dew point, 60.9%. Wet bulb temperature, 63.5. Air temperature, 66.1. How did they even get it that cold in there? I'll tell you in a minute. Relative humidity, 64.9%. Dew point, 54 degrees wet bulb temperature 58.7 so think about that if you if you understand psychometrics at all think about what we're saying there is going on think about the conditions not only what we saw but what we didn't see what's going on behind the walls what's going on in the in the attic what's going on anywhere that that you uh um can't see let alone what you can see where the water, it's water everywhere in these places because what's happening is these systems are grossly oversized because of the way they were engineered. And these tenants are grossly uncomfortable because of the equipment that was installed. And the only thing that they can think to do is turn the thermostat down, turn the thermostat down, turn the thermostat down, because that's the only out that they have. That's the only thing people know about, about comfort uh in terms of being comfortable when it's hot outside is get inside the air conditioning to them air conditioning means cold air that's all they all they know so they turn it down and what are they doing they're creating the worst situation possible like they are creating a situation where their dew points happening on every metal surface and even on surfaces that aren't metal in the house any surface that something can condense on there one lady had a glass jar sitting on her counter and there was condensation i'm like were you drinking out of that she said it's been sitting there for three days it had condensation water dripping off of it a glass jar so like that's what was going on in these apartments when i walked into them and it wasn't just one building i was all over the country i was in iowa i was in, in ohio i was in uh, uh missouri like all kinds of different places that that in the midwest that that this was happening at so um I'll read some of this stuff. Just what what I have up is our findings page. And so, uh, oh, I'm on the two minute warning. So I better crank up here, uh, crank it up for you. So basically, here's what we found when we went in there. Uh, when we conducted the, the, the visual inspections of the units with the testing, we observed multiple surfaces that were visibly wet. We measured dry bulb air temperatures ranging from 72 to 62 degrees. We measured wet bulb temperatures ranging from 55 to 64 degrees and relative humidity ranging anywhere from 77 to 61%. Nothing was under 60%. Everything was above 60%. 61 is the lowest we got. Uh, the common areas also were in effect. I won't even talk about those right now, but that's another big piece of what was going on um and these were i do i will say this out loud these were certified energy star homes that had went through a review process they had went through engineering they had went through everything we just talked about and they made it to this point that is an abomination but it is not unusual it happens over and over and over again and so 
we found that all bedrooms had units had 12,000 BTU variable speed heat pumps installed. The 12,000 BTU heat pump had the ability to run at a minimum of 6.5 uh, six, or 6,500 BTUs. The average load calculated using peak load conditions of 90 degree outdoor and 75 indoor for the one bedroom units was 5,930 degree or BTUs. So that's at peak, okay? That's 1% of the time that it's going to get that hot, that uh, that you're going to have that high of a load. Everything else is something smaller than that. What do you think's happening uh, when you have a heat pump in there that's a one ton heat pump that can only get down to 6,500 6, BTUs? It's a single stage piece of equipment at that time. Um, is there something different they could have done? Probably. Should they have put a, a dehumidification on here if that was the only thing they could have done? Absolutely. Were they ever going to be able to do that? Was it ever suggested? No, it definitely was never suggested. And I can tell you right now from being involved in the on the um design side uh at the beginning stages of these big projects that dehu unless you have somebody like me who's just an asshole and won't shut up like that dehu is getting ve'd out of there very quickly they don't see it as a as a um a, as a necessity at all and the two bedrooms are the same but it gets worse because the two bedrooms had a 24,000 btu piece of equipment installed the minimum uh with a minimum capacity of not much less 7.5 to 6.5 thousand BTUs, 7,500 to 6,500 BTUs. The average load calculated for the two bedroom was 6,994 BTUs. Then we get into the three bedrooms. The three bedrooms had 36,000 BTU variable speed heat pumps installed. The, lo the average load for the bedroom uh, at peak conditions was 8,185 BTUs. The maximum load for any three bedroom, no matter where it was located, was 9,666 BTUs. Did we ever come close to three tons? Not even close. So this is just a big one example of a much bigger problem that has to be solved. And Shelby's kicking me out. So I'll talk to you guys later. Oh, Jeremy, I'm so sorry. But we'll come back to you because we are going to pivot to Q&A very shortly. Um, so first off, before we do that, I just want to thank everyone thus far for their questions. Please keep them coming over the next few minutes. Um, but I do want to thank all of our incredible panelists uh, for sharing their thoughts. So Jim Bergman, Dominic Guarino, and Jeremy Bagley, once again, your experience and wisdom have not only enriched today's discussion, but given us all a little bit of a roadmap of the challenges ahead. Um, and so today was just the beginning. In the following weeks, uh, we're going to do a deep dive even deeper into many of these critical topics. So uh, next week will be my personal favorite, uh, the nitty gritty of design and sizing and equipment selection uh, before tackling installation, commissioning and standards and wrapping it all up with a session on IRAs and rebates. Um, but before the, we head to q and I just want to hand it over quickly to Brent, um, who will share a little bit about the Heat Pump Symposium, one of the uh, wonderful participants in this, uh, in this webinar series. Thank you, Shelby. Uh, yeah, so we have the heat pumps. Heat pumps, uh, even if you're experienced, there's a lot of great training and conference content for the day. We've got uh, actually the Measure Quick team is attending. We'll have Joe doing a training on, on Measure Quick tools and um, commissioning processes and a bunch of other great stuff. Head over to the heatpumpsummit.org website. And um, it's in Berkeley, California. So it is definitely a West Coast event. It's going to be a little bit more relevant for people who are in the state of California, as we'll have a lot of great information on rebate programs. But obviously, all the heat pump specific training, you know, is going to be relevant to anybody getting in the field. Uh, two tracks, conference content that's still very much a contractor focused conference content, but is a step out wider to exciting things like the demand flex market, being paid to participate when your equipment is actually taking part in demand response programs, things like that. Training content is then a bit more end-to-end -end from how to make money and run your whole business on heat pumps. Larry Waters, Electrify My Home, has been doing uh, heat pumps only for many years now. He's going to share some of his tips and tricks. Uh, down through, like I mentioned, Joe, and then a building engineer uh, named Benjamin Nope, who will, along similar lines as we just heard, go into a bunch of things that you need to know for doing heat pumps. Um, Heatpumpsummit.org, and um, check it out. That's what I got for you. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, really appreciate that. And I can definitely attest those are some incredible people and incredible speakers that, that you'll be having um, at the Heat Pump Symposium. So with that, I am going to uh, pivot over to Q&A. Um, and we're going to actually go back to Jeremy for a second um, and, and ask him a question from the audience, which is, what do you suggest regarding the requirements for green programs, building codes? Um, what are some of the things that you wish you saw in some of those programs? And this was a question from the audience. The main thing that I wish I saw is structured education for HVAC. That has been uh, HVAC since I've been involved in green building, which has been since 2008, has been the redheaded stepchild of uh, the green building world. Like they know that it's the and, and Energy Star. Uh, I said a lot of things about Energy Star, but I will give Energy Star credit for one thing: is like they understand that it's not enough, and they keep trying to find ways to do that to to um, create at least standards that will drive people to need to get more educated uh, and also service some of the things that we talked about and still keep the amount of uptake that needs for a program to exist. Because that's part of the problem is they're scared of losing participants. So even though they create, Energy Star is a, a good habit of creating something really good and really strict and uh, being the thing and then getting a bunch of pushback and, and walking it back. And so, and, and they have to, because then people just stop using it. Like the market drives the market, you know, money drives the market. And if it's too hard, nobody's going to do it. So the most important piece is not the requirements that are getting put in place, but the ability to provide the education needed for people to actually understand this. Because even at the engineering level, like I interact with a lot of these guys, I've changed a lot of their minds, and it just takes showing them where they're wrong and where where things are being done wrong and why it's causing these problems and i mean it's unfortunate but you do need a little bit of pain like and they're seeing that with these moisture issues and things like that but pain brings change like you're never going to have people change and, until it hurts what they're doing and the way that they do it so the I, I just go back to it again and again like the education has to be much 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 better and it has to be uh one of the things on the forefront instead of an afterthought here because you know the green building world in general is great at creating uh standards and um things to go by and they're in place every one of these green building programs say use ACA's manual j use ACA's manual s use ACA's manual d uh defer to energy star defer to ashray but that's where it starts and stops at. They say use these things and then they may check a box to say they use them, but nobody is really diving in and looking at if it was done accurately or at all. When I got into uh, doing uh, inspections in the lead world, I had one of the providers tell me, eh, as long as they turn in something, we don't care if it's on the back of a napkin, something's better than nothing. No, 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 no. Something is not better than nothing. Nothing is still nothing if it's done wrong. Like that's still nothing. So like that thinking has to stop and the education piece has to be way, way stronger than what it is. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Really appreciate that. Um, one question uh, from the audience from David Horton, uh, with all the heat pump hype, how can we convince people to be open to the idea that heat pumps are not always the regular design? Um, I know every single one of you could answer this question well. Uh, perhaps, Dominic, you can speak a little bit to this. We have some follow-up questions around dual fuel as well. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Shelby? Oh, you're muted. Uh, with all the heat pump hype, how can we convince people to be open to the idea that heat pumps are not always the right answer for a particular design? Well, I, I think by showing them data, by actually sharing information, uh, a big part of what we focus on when we train contractors and their, their, their employees is, is consumer education. If you can make the customer smarter or help make them smarter about their, their choices, by sharing data, by sharing, you know, this is the condition of your system. Uh, heat pump may not be the right choice for this for these reasons, you know, including, as I think someone said earlier, might have been Jeremy, is the duct system was sized for gas heating, much smaller than, um, than is needed for a heat pump system. 
so, um, you know, I think that the key is education and, and knowing when to say no, walk away. I, I can tell you, I remember when I was selling back in the early 90s, uh, how many uh, jobs I walked away from where people did not want to replace the coil along with the condensing unit because the other two or three contractors said, nah, that's not needed. Uh, and I literally would just close things up and, and walk out of the house. Uh, and it's I think we need to be the same way to be able to stand up to, um, you know, the hacks that are out there just slapping stuff in and saying, oh, yeah, we can do that. So, yeah. Thank you, Dominic. Um, and uh, Jim, would love to get your thoughts on this same question as well. Yes, I, I think uh, actually heat pumps are always a solution, just not the only solution and uh, not the only solution for the primary heat source. So there are so many applications where we should just completely stop installing air and leverage heat pumps in the shoulder season. Uh, that's a huge opportunity for us, especially when you look at the East Coast, you look at the number of steam and hot water boilers, dynamic losses with those products where it, they take a long time before they actually start to output heat and they're not operating at their at their peak efficiency until you know they're closer to design operating conditions. Those are excellent op uh, opportunities for heat pumps because they actually um, uh, provide also cooling now. So you know, get the benefit of cooling and we get the, the heating in the shoulder season. Um, and air conditioning in general. I mean, if we just got rid of air conditioners and we went to dual fuel systems, so every installation now becomes a heat pump. Um, that's a that's a tremendous amount of energy savings across the country in all the shoulder seasons and it gives the industry a little bit of comfort and a little bit of chance to actually um, prove that these heat pumps will, will work in cold climates because they're going to find out you know if they do the installation correctly that it will carry it'll carry the uh, the house almost year round than the ever kick on so second go round, they'll probably get rid of that furnace and go to a straight heat pump because now they've got some experience but I think today it's it's too early to um, to do mass uh, heat pump only uh, installations across this country without really considering a dual fuel because uh, I think that's uh, a huge risk and it also um, the industry is just not ready for it. But doing something as simple as getting rid of the air conditioner and uh, making them all heat pumps, I think that's got some real merit. I think it's something we should look at. Um, actually, a follow-up question from Jimmy B on that note is, um, he shared the point that natural gas could be a logical choice. Uh, propane and oil are just as expensive in, kil as in terms of kilowatts per hour in his area. Um, but he is curious about like how, um, how dual fuel can really support that shift and that mo uh, movement uh, to electrifying everything. So, I mean, Dual fuel, obviously, the big advantage to it is the is the amount of time that we can run off of the heat pump system in lieu of the gas or propane or oil appliance. Um, we're typically only seeing peak demand of somewhere between you know 10 and 18 days a year in a lot of climates. So we're talking about a very short amount of time that we need uh, a heating system that can have outputs um, higher than a heat pump would re produce. So there's the, the, the big the big opportunity here is um, is the uh, shoulder season savings and and that's that's how we're going to support that type of uh, transition. Absolutely. Please uh, go ahead. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. <clears throat> I just wanted to give a little um, antidote, or lack of a better term. Uh, I I was recently in a Mitsubishi training class and they were talking about their new smart coil. And what their smart coil is, is a coil that will allow you to pair any, or their smart coil, I should say, is, is a coil that will allow you to pair any of their inverter heat pumps um, with a gas furnace and create a dual, tool, dual fuel situation. You can even do multi-heads off of it and things like that. So in that presentation, the guy said a very interesting thing. He said, this coil is training wheels for heat pumps. Basically meaning that the dual fuel allows people to get it exactly what Jim was saying, 
get a taste of how the heat pump can heat and heat their house and and how it's okay and that hey this furnace almost is never kicking on like you know and they experience that with the comfort of still knowing that they have the gas there to kick on if they do get too cold at some time some time point so i think that that is where the market is right now like they we need this segue it can't just be um all out heat pumps everywhere because people are either going to get hesitant and push back and not want to do it at all or they're going to have a experience uh that they're not used to and not understand uh how it is to live with that type of heat and it's going to be something that may be foreign to them and they're going to go right back to a gas furnace so i think that the looking at the dual fuel as training wheels is a good analogy uh for us in the industry here Fantastic. Uh, thank you for those thoughts, Jeremy. And one more question for you, um, as well as the others on the line, is uh, what are your thoughts on Manual J overestimating the sizing of heat pumps in cold climates, and how can this be overcome? Um, I am not going to speak to that because I'm not sure what what the uh, derivative of that is, and I don't know that I've directly experienced that yet. I'd like to hear more about that, though. So whoever that, that person is, if they could shoot me a, an email or a private message, maybe we could talk about that in, on the next um, sizing session that we do. Absolutely. Okay. We will get we will get that done. Um, and then on, on a similar note, uh, I'll keep it coming back to you. Uh, this is a question from John Whitehead. What is the best entry point for uh, folks who are considering starting to do load calculations for a new company uh, that want to size a project properly. Um, I am definitely biased on this, so I'm gonna hand it back to you. So I think um, that they're asking about software maybe. I'm not sure exactly what they what what we're talking about entry that point. That is but correct. We, yes, okay. they're asking about okay. software. Okay, so I would definitely say RightSoft is, is um, and I'm biased because I use RightSoft, but I also have Elite and I've used a lot of the other programs out there. And I know that there are some, you know, like do 3D and things like that. But from a pure need to do everything perspective, if you're sitting down and designing it at your desk and you're doing new construction, RightSoft is the right thing to do. Um, you, the Shelby's product, Conduit, is a walkthrough manual J uh calculation that is much using the lidar L lidar technology of the ipad and you're able to walk through your house take measurements and come up with a uh, a good load calculation by the time you sit down at the table if you're doing it out in the field this is the type of thing you want to be looking for like you don't need something that you have to take back to the office and sit down and do a bunch of measurements and calculations you need to be able to talk to people right there on the spot or else it turns into a sales failure and this this new this technology that kind to it had i've been waiting for it for for a very long time like i had the right soft uh mobile right j program that was made to work on a cell phone or a tablet and to walk through our house and it's not that great it's super clunky it can get the job done if you know what you're doing but um the walkthrough technology is something that you want if you're you're, you're doing it out in the field if you're coming back to your your desk and you're going to design something from scratch then i would use right soft that's what i know and love Thank you, Jeremy, um, and and thank you for the kind words. I'm going to hand it to Jim. Yeah, and I would just say that the, the the to answer John's question, I think that the most the best software that you're going to find is the one that you're going to actually use. Uh, I think you know it's a a big challenge out here is is we have a lot of people have tools at their disposal, but they don't use them because they're 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 too clunky or too hard. And I think this goes back to what a lot of people in this group are trying to do is to solve some of these very complex problems with by leveraging technology and so um it's it's really important that we uh more important than anything that, that we actually do the heat load though and i think uh, so finding a software whether it's you know um wh whatever one it's the one you're going to use john because there's a lot of great softwares out there um, some of them are, are easier to use than others, but if you don't, if you get something you don't use it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And that's the problem we have with the industry today right now is that heat loss calculations are so clunky and, and, uh, and cumbersome. And they also provide so much uh, variability sometimes when it comes to uh, what, what, what Shelby was saying is oversizing. And a lot of these are very conservative when they come to sizing, but they're only conservative because you're not giving it enough information. And so what happens is, is that 
the more information you give these softwares, the more precise your heat load's gonna be. And we do things we don't, like we, we talk about ventilation, but we don't do a blow door test to figure out what, how tight the house is, or uh, we, we have to take an educated guess on construction. So, you know, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there that we can, we can uh, uh, pick from, but I think for, at, at the end of the day, you, you gotta reach out to people and find out what they're actually, what they're actually using, what they're having success with. Um, uh, because that's that that's the name of the game is actually doing it. Amazing, Jim. That is so helpful and is a perfect way to conclude today's session. Um, our next webinar is about uh, design. Uh, and sizing, and that's going to be led by Jeremy Begley and Alex Meany, um, and so I can't wait for it personally. But just want to thank everyone who dialed in today for joining us, um, as well as uh, as well as our, our wonderful panelists today. So thank you, everyone, and um, we'll stay on if there's a few additional questions. Uh, but just thank you, everyone, for joining, and this concludes the official webinar. All right, um, then if there's, uh, we can take one or two more questions if uh, folks, there's one more that I think we didn't get to um, that I'll actually hand over to, uh, hand over to, to uh, the folks on the line, but it is a question about ductwork, um, which is why we feel that a duct, ductwork issues are more significant with heat pumps versus uh, straight or normal air conditioning uh, systems. And I, I see Jim right away, so I will hand that question to you. This is a, a, a burning question from someone. Yeah, so it, it's really it really comes down to heat. Heat is a quantity, right? So, and the quantity of heat that we deliver is based upon volume and, and temperature. So, when we have a uh, if we're going to move the same amount of heat at a lower temperature difference, then we got to move a higher volume of it. And so, what this all comes down to is existing duct systems were designed for furnaces that had temperature rises between 100 and 140 degrees in a lot of cases. Today, we're, we're now dropping that down to 15 to 45 degree rise. So the amount of, of, of uh, CFM or the amount of air delivery that's required is sometimes two to three times the amount that the duct system is actually rated for. And so this leads to a lot of issues with high static pressures, uh, a lot of noise, uh, ex exacerbating leakage issues now because we have higher pressure pushing through the same amount of holes. and um, and then uh, obviously uh, that all leads to delivery problems where we're not actually delivering the BTUs that are generated at the heat source to the space. And this is a, a problem, whether we're talking about ducts internal or external to the envelope, meaning inside or outside of the house, but it's a huge problem when they're outside um, because those BTUs are lost directly to the outside space. Uh, but it's a big problem inside too because um, things like these ECM motors uh, experience a higher rate of failure. And so, you know, if we have to change an ECM out, a motor out uh, during the lifetime of a furnace out of warranty, $1,200 to $1,600 motor that could eat up all of the lifetime savings of the, of the heat pump. Boy, I was gonna add to that, Jim, but uh, you covered, yeah, sometimes I think we share a brain. Uh, you covered exactly what I was going to say. And, uh, you know, the, the other thing is what I've been hearing, too, with inverter technology, it, it does also, it can exacerbate the problem if your statics are real high um, and sort of uh, negate the, the value of the inverter technology. But all the things Jim said, uh, absolutely. And which is what we focus on a lot in our training. Uh, so thank you. Perfect. Well, the the final question that that we'll ask in this run over time is just um, around refrigeration leak, uh, refrigerant leak post installation and the problems that that can cause. Um, one of the questions, the, the question is very simple, is who in the industry is thinking about this? And I, I think some of the folks on this line are. So, Jim, over to you. Yep. So, yeah, this is this is an interesting an interesting issue because um, I, I'm under the opinion that manufacturers don't make leaky systems. So they're, 
this equipment's tested very well from the factory. The, the issue comes down to is improper evacuation and the resulting form of carrier corrosion of the systems. When, we, when we're evacuating a system, what we don't realize is that uh, the bulk of the, of the load is actually moisture. And so when we pull that moisture out, if we don't pull that moisture out, it mixes with the refrigerants and it makes, uh, uh, it makes acids. And those acids then attack the copper and then that copper gets redeposited on bearings and other places it shouldn't be, but also leads to leakage in the system. And so uh, um, refrigerant leakage is a, is a huge problem, uh, not only from a global warming potential um, and uh, ozone depletion potential, but also for overall efficiency of the equipment. So there's, there's a lot that we need to learn, a lot that we need to learn on the evacuation side that we've honestly forgotten as an industry, but also we need to stop putting gauges on systems and we need to stop using hoses. We really need to switch to smart probes. DOE is pushing really hard on that. And we're talking about millions of pounds. Uh, we just ran a calculation um, with the number of systems service. It's about, I want to say it was about 7 million pounds of refrigerant a year is just lost by attaching hoses. So we're talking about leakage out of the system. Even though it may not be the leakage you're considering, it's still loss of refrigerant that causes a tremendous amount of waste. Go yeah. ahead, Dom. Yeah, if I could add to that, um, and this this is something we've been kind of harping on for a very long time, and, and we talk about a lot in our refrigerant side performance training, is that one of the biggest problems in our industry, whether it's heat pumps or straight AC, is that our technicians have been taught the first thing they do when they go to service a, a, a system, a heat pump or AC, is put the gauges on. It's the first thing they do. They walk uh, out of the truck with the gauges slung over their shoulder and they go out to the condensing unit and put the gauges on. That is the absolute worst thing that you can do. That's the last thing you should be doing. You need to first look at airflow, make sure that the air is there, and then look at your delta T across the coil and then if you if your airflow is right and your delta t is off then by all means you know uh, may it might be time to put the gauges on now there's also some non-invasive ways to test you know the temperatures on the refrigerant lines and so forth that should give you a pretty good idea but the problem with putting the gauges on right away is kind of what jim said is the introduction of non-condensables moisture dirt what, whatever it might be into the system it might have been a great sealed system and that that service tech on that one service call messed it up by putting the gauges on with no need to put the gauges on um so my my if i could make a recommendation to any of the techs out there that should be the last thing you pull off the truck not the first thing Thank you so much dominic um and with that we are going to finally close out um, really appreciate all the questions that came in and our presenters for staying on to answer uh, the, the remaining ones that we saw. So thank you everyone and, and enjoy the rest of your day and check out the next webinar on sizing.